How to rebuild a Stuart Models 5A steam engine, this is part 3. Fitting the sole plate to the box bed and making some new crankshaft main bearings. There are one or two puzzling anomalies with these 5A engine parts. One of them being, on the sole plate, two of the holes are drilled to the correct size and the other two are not. So in this clip, I'm drilling out the two smaller holes to match the other two. And the sole plate will then be bolted to the box bed through these holes. And what's this, I hear you ask? It isn't what's left of the 5A box bed by being too close to a nuclear explosion. It's an impression of the box bed in iron filings on the bench. That is because I transferred the hole positions of the sole plate by using a transfer punch. And by hitting the transfer punch with a hammer, this transferred the hole positions from the sole plate into a centre punch mark on the box bed. And the shock of the hammer blow on the box bed dislodged a lot of iron filings which are now on the bench. And as you can see, I'm just cleaning them up. So where's the video? Well, I was very incompetent, and read that as incompetent, not incontinent. I forgot to press record. This is a problem with doing it live, I don't get a second chance. So this is the best I can show you. This is the sole plate being temporarily bolted to the box bed. And before any fingers descend on any keyboards, these are temporary bolts. And they came from an old bed. I'm even using the Allen key that came with the bed. These will have to suffice for the time being, because today is Sunday and the place where I get the bolts doesn't open at the weekends. Generally, I don't get bolts this size from Blackgate's Engineering. I get them from a local fastening supply. I'm quite pleased with the fit of the sole plate on top of the box bed, and now it's time to measure for the bolts. My usual trick is to forget to measure something and then estimate the size when I get to the supplier and come back with the wrong size. I think I'll get some of these really nice stainless steel domed nuts as well, and some stainless steel washers to suit. There is supposed to be a small peg in this hole, which locates the bearing and stops it rotating. So I quickly made one and tapped it into position. It doesn't need to stick out very far, just far enough to stop the bearing from rotating. And while on the subject of bearings, here they are. A pair of gunmetal bearings. The problem is, someone's bored these out to the wrong size, and I think I know why. I was originally going to make a complete new set of bearings, because look at these. These are miles too big. I think the original plan with this engine was to sleeve the bearings, and many times I've contemplated doing this, so in this one instance I'm going to sleeve these bearings and make it so I have a removable centre part, and when they wear, I can just pull out the sleeve and make another sleeve because it's much quicker to make a simple sleeve than it is to make these split bearings. And as you can clearly see in this clip, this is a large lump of phosphor bronze that I was about to make some new bearings from, but then I thought, I have a plan. First of all, I'm going to make the sleeves that fit in the bearings. And to make these bearing bushes, I'm going to use my Smart and Brown lathe. And here it is, and the job is underway. I'm going to speed up this process, otherwise the video is going to be very, very long and very, very tedious. In order to get this bearing bush to be a really good fit in the original bearings, I'm taking great care with it. I've fastened both halves of the bearing together with a couple of cable ties, and I keep trying the original bearings on the piece that I'm machining, and by testing the size of the part that I'm machining before every pass, I can get a very, very accurate fit. And once I get the part quite close to the size that I need, I frequently test it with the bearing. And I will only take a cut along the full length of the work once I make sure that it isn't too small. It's quite important when you do a job like this to make sure that the lathe that you use is accurate. Some lathes are not accurate and will turn tapers, and that's no good at all. Luckily, both of my lathes, and they're very old and a bit decrepit, but just like me, most of the important parts are still in good working order. And eventually, almost in no time at all, I get the part to the dimension that I require. And then I start the drilling process with a centre drill, followed by a twist drill. And this twist drill is a couple of drill sizes below the diameter I finally require. The final internal diameter that I need is 11 16 of an inch. Why 11 16 of an inch? What a silly size! I don't have a reamer for that. But I do have a drill. I do have an 11 16 drill, 
and I can't remember where that came from, probably from a scrapyard years ago. Ordinarily, I wouldn't show this because I'm going to get a lot of criticism. Oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. But I don't have the tooling. I don't have a boring tool that's long enough or the right width to fit down an 11 16th hole. I don't have an 11 16th reamer. I do have some expanding reamers, but they need setting up. So I'm going to try this drill and we'll see what happens. What have I got to lose? Just a piece of phosphor bronze. And I suppose I can go out and buy an 11 16th reamer. And as I said previously, today is Sunday and all the shops are shut. So I want to try and get on with it and I'll see what happens once I drill all the way through this piece of phosphor bronze with this 11 16th drill. This part of the video is running in real time. And what I'm doing is feeding the drill in quite slowly because I want the drill to clean up the hole as it progresses into the work. I think it's time to skip to the next section. I really have seen enough of this. And at the time it was quite nerve wracking. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Is it going to be too big? Is the finish going to be any good? Anyway, we'll have a look, shall we? Well, the finish is very good indeed. Almost a reamed finish. So I think it's time to part this off. Once again, I'm using the original bearing as a template, so I know how long to make this bush. Making the bearing bush for the other side is quite simple. I've already bored the hole down the centre, so now I'm just turning up a mandrel, and then I give the mandrel a good coat of Loctite 603, and put the bush in place. And after about five minutes, the bush is firmly secured to the mandrel by the Loctite 603. All I need to do is exactly what I did in the first place, turn this to the external dimension to fit inside the bearing itself. While the phosphor bronze bush is still on the mandrel, I can't part it off fully, but I can cut through the phosphor bronze, and then all I need to do is heat up the mandrel, and the phosphor bronze bearing bush drops off it. Now I have a pair of bearing bushes that fit perfectly inside the original bearings. The next step was to fit these bearing bushes to their respective main bearings and drill through the oil hole. For the next job, I moved on to the small Boxford lathe. I'm using the parting tool in the Boxford lathe to cut a very small groove around the centre of the bearing bush, exactly where the oil hole is. And I'm doing this because if ever the bearing bush was to rotate in the main bearing, then the crankshaft would become starved of oil. But by machining this shallow groove all the way round, it doesn't really matter if the bearing bush moves in the main bearing. The crankshaft will still receive lubrication. It's a belt and braces approach because this bearing bush is not going to rotate in the main bearings. Once the main bearing top caps are tightened down, the pressure of the split bearing will hold the bush in place. When these bushes become worn, I simply make two new ones and it doesn't take long at all, it's much quicker than making a full split main bearing. That's it for the moment, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.